Well, good morning, Oakwood. Welcome to part four of our series called The Church Defined as we look at the book of Titus. So if you have your Bible this morning, I invite you to turn there to the book of Titus near the end of the New Testament, so toward the back of your Bible. As always, if you brought your phone or a tablet or an iPad, you're welcome to follow along on there. If you'll download the Oakwood app, um, just search Oakwood Enid in your app store and then uh, download the app, go to sermon notes and all of the scriptures and everything will be there for you this morning. The main thing we want you to do this morning is to be engaged in the word of God as we allow God to speak to us this morning. In this series, we've been talking about the church defined because the book of Titus was written at a specific time to a specific situation. The apostle Paul writes this letter to Titus who has been uh, sent to Crete and is, and is in, in this place where all of these new and young church plants are happening. And so the church is growing, the church is young, it's vibrant, but it's got a lot of newbies in it. And the apostle Paul says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave Titus here in Crete and I want you to do some things. And he writes him this letter, giving him instructions on how they are to do church. How can we be a church that God desires? This isn't a church that's a building. This is the church of the people, the people of God, the gathering of the saints. And so uh, to help with this, he writes this letter, and that's what we've been studying. We're going to continue in that today as we get to chapter 2. Now, the first uh, three parts of this we've been talking about, the first week we talked about how we are called to stand firm on the truth of the Word of God. That the Bible is the end all in all matters of faith and practice for a Christian. And so we're going to hold up the truth of God. It is the final say in our lives. The next week we talked about elders. What is an elder? Who were these godly men, this plurality of godly men who are appointed to lead the churches there in Crete and lead the churches even today? And we talked about that. What does that mean? Looked at those qualities and those characteristics. And then last week we talked about how um, we, the, the, he was warning the church that legalism and false teaching could make its way into the congregation. And again, it was telling the church to wake up and pay attention and to make sure that we're studying everything out, to make sure that the truth is being taught, to make sure that you don't uh, do what legalism is, right? Legalism is when we take the Word of God and we take God's law and we add to it. We put some human traditions on there, like you got to wear a tie to church, you know, something like that. We talked about that last week. And then today we're going to continue uh, in our study because we are talking today about how we are called by God to be an example for others. We are to set an example for others. Let's read the text together. Titus chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. We're going to look at three verses today. It says this. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Now let's contextualize this just a little bit. Okay, Paul is talking to Titus here, and so he's addressing Titus here in verse 1. He says, hey, you, Titus, however, you must teach, not you ought to teach, or you could teach, or you should teach, but no, it's, it's, it's imperative here. You must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. In other words, we're going back to what, the, what is the truth of the Word of God, what is the truth of the Word of Scripture. And then verse 2, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. And likewise, just like you're teaching the older men, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. There's so much for us to unpack uh, from this text this morning. One of the things that we want to remember is that God of what God has called us to as Christians, as he's called us to set an example. It was World War II, and General Patton was leading a brigade of soldiers, thousands of soldiers actually under his command at the time, across Europe. And the story goes that they came to a swollen river that had, had been at flood stage, and the men got to the edge of the river, and, and Patton said, you got to go across the river. And they were to put on their packs, on their backs, and go across the river. And the men said, hey, we can't get across the river. We cannot carry these heavy packs. We're not going to make it. We're all going to drown. And the story says that General Patton, who was at the back of them, walked all the way to the front, came to the edge of the river. He put his pack on. He walked down into the river. He went across the river. Then he, he got to the other side. Didn't say a word. Turned around. Put his, with his pack on, came back across the river, came up on the shore, and simply said to the men, follow me. Turned back around and went back across the river. 
All the men made it across the river that day. But it speaks to this thing, this principle that I want us to get this morning, is that sometimes we are inspired more by example than instruction. We are inspired more by example than instruction. We are inspired more sometimes by seeing someone walk more than we hear them talk. But then when you think about God's church, you think, where are the godly examples today? Where do we look for examples in our life of how we should live? You know, the culture would say, hey, we look at the famous people, we look at the wealthy people, we look at the social media people, we look at the athletes, we look at the politicians. (laughs) Yeah. Um, We look at Hollywood, you know, because they're so moral and upright. And those are the places where you're going to take your cues on how you are to live. But I'm telling you, we have an absence, I feel like, of godly examples in Christianity today. People who are just faithful, that others will look up to and follow. And one of the greatest needs in the church today, not only Oakwood Christian Church, but I just mean the church at large today. I think one of the greatest needs in the church today is godly mentors. Godly mentors. People who actually exemplify their faith. That they will actually walk it out in this lost and broken and pagan world today. We need some mature Christians who will inspire people in their walk with God. Now I want you to notice something from the text we read just a minute ago. From from Titus chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. Did you notice right away that 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 it's cross-generational? That that he's addressing these churches and the churches are already cross-generational. They're not a bunch of 20-somethings or a bunch of 30-somethings or... You know, he, he, he is considered here to be kind of at the same age range as Timothy. He's called a son in the faith to Paul, which gives you this idea that, you know, Paul not only was a part of his conversion to Christ Jesus, but that Paul was also actually, was actually older than him. So we don't know exactly the age of Titus. I tried to study that out. No one really knows the age of Titus, but most scholars believe that he, he is a younger man. And here in our text today, it says to teach the older men and to teach the older women. Now, next week when we continue in our series and we get to verse 4 and beyond, then it says that we're going to teach the younger women and also the younger men. And so we see that these churches from the very beginning in Crete are cross-generational. And in this cross-generational dynamic, Paul is asking Titus to teach the older men and women to be examples to those that are younger, to exemplify this Christ-filled life. But I didn't want to, I know that's not something that's really in the notes or anything, but I just wanted to point that out. That these, are, these are cross-generational churches, just like Oakwood. It's, it, it, it's, it's a bunch of age range and a bunch of people learning how to walk out this faith from one another. First thing from our text that we can get today is this, that teachers must teach God's word accurately and consistently. The teachers must teach the word of God accurately and consistently. Look at verse 1. It says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. You've got to teach the truth, and it's an imperative. You must teach it. It's not suggested. It's saying you are going to teach this. You know, I was thinking about, you know, if I were God, I doubt that I would continue sending people and growing a church And keep adding to their number if they didn't have a number of people who were examples and who were able to teach others. And I think that God has called a lot more people to teach in the church than are actually teaching today. Now, this isn't just an Oakwood problem. I think this is a church universal problem. But it can affect the outreach and the discipleship and the ministry of a church. I don't know if you remember this time, but it was about 15 years ago, we had a crisis in the airline industry. We had a shortage of air traffic controllers. I don't know if you remember that, but they were, counsel- they were canceling thousands of flights because of a shortage of air traffic controllers. Now, if you think about that, that's a pretty important thing. I mean, to get a plane off the ground, obviously the first thing we look to is a pilot, right? We, we want, we want the, the guy with the most experience and the most landings and takeoffs and has handled the most turbulence. And, you know, we got to have a good pilot. you got to have a good ground crew because, you know, they need to fill 
the plane with fuel. You know, you want to be one of those planes that gets up there and, oh, I'm out of fuel already, got to circle back or gliding back to the runway. I mean, there's all these things and all these components which makes the airline industry work, but the air traffic controllers. And they're actually not, not hired by the airlines. They're actually uh, part of the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. But these air traffic controllers are the ones that are the leaders that are barking out the orders in the air. They're giving instructions to these pilots about, all oh, right, you know, clear to land on runway 17. Okay, clear, clear to land on 3208. We've got, we've got a plane on the tarmac. It's taxiing across the runway there. I'm going to need you to circle around and come back again. That's your 15-minute delay of circling in the air while you're waiting to land. But they do that. Why? They do it for safety. They do that because they're the instructors in the air. Those those air traffic controllers are the ones that are making sure that everyone's safe. They're making sure everyone gets to their destination safely. They're the ones giving the instructions. And you can see when, when there's a shortage of that, it affects everything in the airline industry. How much more in the ministry of God's church when we don't have enough spiritual traffic controllers? We don't have enough people mentoring and teaching and being example to the flock. There's a shortage of it. And I know that some people are afraid to teach because when you put yourself in a position of influence and authority like that, sometimes people are going to come against you. They, they, they're going to come against the truth. They're going to oppose you. They don't want to hear that they are accountable to God for what they say and what they do. They, they, they don't like to hear that some things that they do are sinful and that they're out of line. They don't want to reflect on the fact that one day they're going to stand before the Lord God Almighty and they're going to have to give an account of everything they said and everything they did. And so I kind of get it. It's like, man, being a teacher, being someone that, that teaches others in the way of Scripture is not, is not the easiest job in the world, but it is necessary to grow people God's way. It's necessary to disciple and build up God's church. We need more teachers. But teachers must accurately teach God's word and be consistent in it. And then he goes on in the next verse there in verse 2. And he's, he gives us these teachings to the older, more mature men. It's specifically tar targeted, targeted to them. Now, I did a little study on this. What does it mean when he says in there, teach the older men? And in verse 3, teach the older women. What did it mean to be older? Most of the time, what I found was that older was considered over 40. You know what that means? It means I'm older. <laughs> Just realized that after studying this. Thank you, Lord. Uh, but here's the deal. is like It's those of non-childbearing age is kind of like how they, how they saw it there. And so around 40 years old, they were saying, hey, teach the older men to be temperate. Okay, let's just read verse 3. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Teach these older, more mature men to do what? The first thing here is to be temperate and clear-minded. To be temperate and clear-minded. What it's saying here is that these older men would be an example to everyone to take life seriously. Not that there's some kind of killjoy and they're not any fun, but they know when it's time to be serious. They take serious their faith. They take serious God's work. They value what God wants for their life. That means that their life doesn't revolve around the next ball game, around the next hunting trip, next television program, the next activity that they want to go to. That they actually have spiritual priorities in their life and they are temperate and clear-minded about the direction of their life. And they take it serious. And they model that for the younger men. Be temperate and clear-minded. The second thing it talks about there in the text is to be worthy of respect, to be dignified. Worthy of respect, to be dignified. I think that is so absent in our culture today, wouldn't you say? With the political climate like it is, we can't even have a healthy uh, debate on politics anymore before it just spins out. No one respects anyone. We're in this protest climate in our culture. We have to protest everything. No one seems to be able to have a dignified, respectful conversation with anyone. And it seems like it's even crept its way into God's church. That Christians can sometimes not be able to be, able to be respectful of each other, to lend credence when it is called for. 
to be dignified in their speech and to be able to talk to each other. And how much more so do we see that reflected in the culture that the church should be called to be different than that? And that's what he's saying here. Paul is telling Titus here, hey, these older men, you need to teach them to be worthy of respect, to be dignified men, to make that a part of your culture as they are people to be looked up to in their faith. Which begs the question, are you worthy this morning of someone respecting you? Are you living your life in such a way that people look at you as one who is dignified? Third thing this morning is that these older men would be self-controlled, that they would be sensible about their lives, self-controlled, sensible. Now, if you notice, you've heard this before, right? If you go over to chapter 1, this was actually one of the characteristics that was given to elders in verse 8. Verse 8 says, rather he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And yet, here's the same exact quality from verse 8 brought over here to just the older men in the church. Not, not necessarily them holding the position of an elder as a church leader, but just to Christians to say, hey, they are to be self-controlled. They are to be sensible. Because we'd read there in chapter 1 also that the Cretans weren't living this way. <laughs> it was part of the Cretan culture was to not have in practice any self-control. And sometimes... I think as Christians, we struggle to leave our past behind. And sometimes we bring some of the patterns and maybe even the sinfulness of the past into our future in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm one of those. I believe that there are some things that happen when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. That moment of salvation, there are some things that change in your life. I think sometimes the scales on your eyes fall off and you can just see things differently. You can... You can you can have this relationship with God that now is, is much closer than it was before. And you feel the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. Sometimes you just can't live the way you did before. You just, you just have this conscience that, that is just way more in step and in tune with the will of God in your life. But I also believe in the process called sanctification. Sanctification is a process, and it's the process of us becoming more like Jesus. The process of maturity. The process of us becoming more self-controlled and sensible. And in this process of self-control, I thought of a lot of areas of life that we need to bring under control, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's our mouth. Maybe it's our mind. Maybe it's those times in life where we get spun off, we get a little angry, we get out of sorts. Maybe it's in our actions. Maybe it's in our words. Maybe it's in our deeds. But we need to not let the past be governing our future. We are called to throw off things and to put on things in the Christian walk. One of those things that we need to grow in is self-control. And the older men are to lead the charge in this area. The fourth teaching to the older, mature men here is to be sound in your faith. It says there to be sound in the faith. To know what you believe and to walk firmly in it. That you will stand firm in your faith. That you will be one of those that will be a pillar of faith for others to look at. That the older men would be seen as these pillars of faith in the church that the younger men could look up to and say, man, I want to be like that person because they are solid in their faith. They know what they believe. They've drawn their line and they've said, you know what? This is what God wants for my life. And I'm going to stand firm in God's truth about it. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, it says this. It says, then we will no longer be infants. It's talking about infants in the faith. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching. We're going to know what we believe. We're not going to just listen to the latest fad, just be blown around in our doctrine. It says, and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Because the false teachers that we talked about last week, they do this on purpose. Instead, it says, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. We're going to grow to become in every respect. In what respect? In every respect. Every respect? Every respect. The mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. That's what the older men are called. 
that in every respect they would become the mature body of Christ and they would be sound in their faith, know what they believe, and set that example for others. The fifth thing to teachings to the older mature men, the fifth thing is to practice love. To practice love. It says they're right, the, the, the second one from the end in, chat, in uh, verse 2 there, says that they are, they are to be sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Sounds so soft and gooey, doesn't it? The guys, I was like, oh, you're supposed to be more loving. Well, the word there is actually agape. And agape gives us this idea of an unconditional holy love. It's not, well, you deserve love, and so I give it to you. It's not, it's not a physical thing. It's not just a mental thing. It's not just an emotional thing. It's not just a feeling. It is actually a love of the will to choose to love someone in spite of of themselves. In fact, agape love focuses on others rather than self. So many times when, when people uh, come to us with marriage problems, a lot of times the core of the issue is you want to be selfish and you want to be selfish. You're loving each other with a love of the world, not God's kind of love. God's kind of love says, you know what, I'm going to put others and what they want and what they need in life before myself. And here, these older men are called to practice, to put into practice love. But I want to take it a step further because there's a wonderful section of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, that talks about this agape love. Actually defines it way clearer. So listen to this because this is what Paul is instructing Titus to tell these older men to live out. Agape is patient. Agape is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It's not prideful. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Listen to this. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. That kind of love. Agape does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always perseveres. Agape never fails. And the word used there in the text in Titus 2.2 is agape. A love of the will. A holy, unconditional love. And they're to put that into practice as they deal with people in their life. And the last one there is to practice endurance. To practice endurance. Practice endurance in life, endurance in the faith, endurance in Christian service. We have this dangerous practice here in America called retirement. Retirement gives us this concept that at the, around the age of 65-ish, um, it gives us the impression that productivity in life stops. That you, you just quit being productive with your life. All of your responsibilities now are to travel and relax. Travel and relax. Maybe play with some grandkids in there, but mainly travel and relax, okay? And the tendency is for sometimes people to retire from ministry. Retire from the faith. Now, I know the mentality here because some people are like, you know, man, I did my time and we got to pass it on to the next generation. Got to pass it on to the younger ones. I taught Sunday school for 17 years and it's their turn. I volunteered in the nursery all of those years and it's their turn. I was a youth sponsor in youth group. I even worked the fireworks stand and now it's their turn. And I did the car washes and I did the this and I did that. I served communion, showed up at 6 a.m. on Sundays to do communion prep and we did our time, now it's your turn. But I don't find that in Scripture. In fact, I think it's interesting that Titus here with these instructions from the Apostle Paul is first addressing the older men and the older women of the church and saying, practice endurance in your service to the Lord. I'm inspired by that in our elders we have an elder who is here first service who is on our elder board who still serves as an elder today. He's 92 years young. 92. He, I, and I, I didn't ask him if I could say this. I said it right in front of him first service. I didn't ask him anything. He didn't know I was going to say anything. But I'm inspired by him because he has shown endurance in his service as an elder to this church. He has every reason to retire. 
He has every reason to resign, to step down, because he's tired. His body's wearing out. The mind is, is maybe fluttering a little more than it used to. He, he's kind of weary in the body, weary in the flesh. But he says, you know what? I want to be a good example. I want to finish my race. I want to be strong. And he does not realize what an example he is to me in endurance, in his faith, in his service to the Lord. And I hope that that's inspiration for some of you. Some of you that have maybe pumped the brakes, you've taken a step back. You're not mentoring anyone. You're not leading anyone. You're not setting an example for anyone. You're not teaching anyone. You're not leading anything. And you might have more time today than you did all those years you were working full time. And show this endurance in the faith and this endurance in the Lord and in service to the Lord and to be an example in that. I know that that many of you would say, well, hey, the problem is this, that we need that vitality and that energy and those ideas of that younger generation. And I completely agree with you, but I would also say this, we need the wisdom and experience of those who are older, to have more life experience that can sometimes help us and mentor us in the ways that we walk out this Christian faith as a part of God's church. Then we get to verse 3. Verse 3 is the teachings to the older, more mature women. And notice what it says there in verse 3. Let's just read it. It says, likewise, just like he was talking to the older men, likewise, teach these older women to do these things, to be reverent in the way that they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Notice the list for the ladies is a little shorter, guys. Okay, that's all right. It starts out there by saying that, that they are to be reverent in how they live. To be reverent in how they live. Any of you have ever watched the comedy called Golden Girls? You had the same reaction first service had. Just a little giggle like, oh yeah, I remember Golden Girls. Golden Girls was a comedy that was built on, a, on this premise that these older women were going to be irreverent. And that everything you expected them to be as mature women, as, as, as the women uh, of that generation and that mindset with their, with their gray hair and the, and the way that they dress and everything. But they were actually going to be irreverent in the way they talked, irreverent in their relationships, irreverent in every way of life. And we sat back and it was shocking and we laughed at the Golden Girls. But that's exact opposite of what Paul's calling Titus to teach them here in the scripture. They're calling... He's calling them to be an example to the younger women of reverence, of holiness, and of humility before the Lord. To be someone who is reverent and reveres the Lord in such a way that it gives the younger ladies someone to look up to. And ladies, you have no idea, but just because of your age and stage of life, there are younger women that are looking to you. They're taking their cues and their faith and their walk from you. And they're watching, how do you revere the Lord in your life? Be reverent in how you live. The second thing is to not slander others. Don't slander others. Gossip is a big temptation for anyone. That, that crosses generations. It crosses you know, genders. Men, men have a struggle with gossip too. Gossip is this big temptation for everyone. But here specifically, it's saying that these older women are to not slander others. It implies that maybe that had been going on. Slander is false and malicious statements that damage the reputation of another. It changes sometimes how people perceive others, and it can ruin relationships and ruin influence in lives. And most of the time, I want you to remember this. The slander says more about the slanderer than the one who is being slandered. As you may be allow your ears to be garbage cans sometimes. Remember that. And this is something that I feel like talking poorly about people behind their back, not talking to them directly, but always trying to work around their back. I've seen more lives and relationships destroyed by that in God's church than really any other thing. And it's sad because it can destroy families, it can destroy friendships, it can destroy relationships in God's church where there's this affront between two parties because someone went behind someone's back and slandered them to someone else. And it's pretty straight here. 
It just says not to be slanderers, to not participate in that. Then it's interesting what's next because what's next it says, or also don't be addicted to much wine. As I read that, I thought, really? It was the ladies? <laughs> you know, a lot of times we think, well, that's more of a male thing, you know? It's, it's, it's the beer culture or whatever, you know, it's, that's, it's more, you know, that was, that was for the older men, not for the older ladies. But no, it's specifically written here to the older ladies. I pulled some statistical data on that, and actually, uh, women who abuse alcohol is on the rise today. And they say the number one reason for that is numbing emotional pain. It's used as something to numb emotional pain. I think for many women, it started out innocently enough. It was just a little bit of alcohol, but then you needed a little more to get the same effect, to calm you down, to give you the buzz, to get you to relax a bit. I haven't drank much alcohol, to be honest with you, in my life, um, but I have had NyQuil a lot. I was introduced to NyQuil as a teenager uh, when, I, when I was really sick. My mom gave it to me and did not say a word. And when I drank that, it was so warm going down in the throat. I was like, man, what is in this stuff? I mean, it's cherry, but my goodness. And you turn the box around, 25% alcohol content in NyQuil, 25%. And man, after you have NyQuil, I kind of like didn't care about <laughs> You know, anything. That's why I, sometimes I have some couple shots of NyQuil before I come out and preach. So I won't be nervous. And... <laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. Don't tell the elders, please. <laughs> but seriously, didn't it start off innocent enough with alcohol with most people? Most people didn't, didn't go to level seven of alcohol consumption. It started off innocently enough. It was just a glass of wine with a meal. You know, ladies, ladies, it was just glass of wine. But now, can you have a meal without wine? Do you have to have wine? But you cannot have this certain meal without the wine. Maybe it's just a little drink before you went to bed. It's just a relaxing drink before you went to bed. But now you have to have it or you cannot fall asleep. And you would say, well, you know, I'm not really addicted to it. But if you can't sleep without it and you can't eat without it, Maybe for some of you, you can't watch the game without it. You can't play another round without it. You can't do your favorite activity. Or when you get together with your friends, you always have to have it. That might be a sign. Don't be addicted to alcohol. Ephesians 5.18 puts it this way. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What that scripture is saying is that God intends us to be under no influence except God's Spirit in our life. You've heard of DUI, driving under the influence. The influence of what? Alcohol. We're to be under the influence of God's spirit, not the influence of anything else in our lives. And so, ladies, don't be addicted to alcohol. Don't be addicted to too much wine. And the last thing it says is, but to teach what is good, to teach others what is good. The older ladies are to be teachers to others of what is good. The literal rendering here is a teacher of goodness. That you value the good things in life, the pure things in life. That you are a positive person that speaks positively about God and his church. And you're not one of those that just carries on the bad things and the negativity of life. Now, I know some of you are like, that's a little Pollyanna. Yeah, maybe it is, but is it needed today? And is it what God intends? Last week we talked about Philippians 4.8, if you remember that. It said that whatever is true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, to think, to dwell, to set your mind on those things. And maybe again, as I said last week, it would be a good filter for you, ladies, for you to be teachers of good, for you to consider the things that are true, the things that are noble. The things that are right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy and that you teach and you dwell and you have your conversations focus on those things. Why? Because it edifies God, his church, and his intention and his spirit to focus on the good things of life that we know the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from where? Above. It comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. Accentuate 
those things in your life. Because I know what it's like. Sometimes, ladies, especially as you get older, you can just rant and rave about everything, and I can't believe she's wearing that, I can't believe this, and I can't believe that. But exemplify those things that are good. Watch for those things that are good. Talk and dwell and teach upon those things that are good. Older men and older women in our text today are called to be examples. And I want to remind you this morning that no matter what your age is this morning, there is always a generation behind you watching how you walk. They're watching how you live. And there's so many of them that would love to have a godly example in their life. Someone, someone that, that just loves Jesus. Someone that actually is considered holy. Someone that actually will put off the old things and put on the new things. Someone that will have a godly witness and an example that someone else could look to and follow. Because your life is a life of influence. And your influence is like a rock thrown into a pond. It has these ripples that go out. Sometimes to spaces you can't see them. What you do in your life right now, it echoes into eternity for someone else. I know, you're like, whoa, that's a lot of responsibility right there. Yeah, it is. But that's what God has called us to. To be examples. To be Jesus with skin on to people. To be godly witnesses. And to live our lives in such a way that it brings him glory. Now, again, these principles today, they're specifically targeted at older men and older women, but I think some of us that are maybe younger in the room today, this is for you too. And if you thought it wasn't, well, guess what? Next week, it's to younger women and younger men. So stay tuned.